attention uh, to the Tavis Smiley Show tomorrow at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 noon Eastern uh, to get a gander at uh, who Dr. Cornell West picks as his VP pick in the presidential race. Some exciting news uh, uh, in politics uh, there. Uh, but uh, it's time for your national news roundup. It's time for the good, bad, and ugly headlines of the day. And uh, kicking us off in Michigan, the Michigan school shooters' parents are sentenced to 10 to 15 years in prison for their role in the attack. The parents of a Michigan school shooter have each been sentenced to between 10 and 15 years in prison for the, their role in an attack that killed four students in 2021. And in a case that has broken new ground as the U.S. seeks to tackle its year long, its years long ap epidemic of school shootings, Jennifer and James Crumbly appeared in court today as the first parents convicted in an American mass school shooting. During their trials, prosecutors said, quote, tragically simple actions by both parents could have stopped the catastrophe. The Crumbly's did not know their son, Ethan Crumbly, was planning the shooting at Oxford High School, but prosecutors said the parents failed to safely store a gun and could have prevented the shooting by removing the 15-year-old from school when confronted with a dark drawing by him that day. Ethan, now 17, pleaded guilty and is serving a life prison sentence. From Michigan to Capitol Hill, where uh, under threat from Marjorie Taylor Greene, would Mike Johnson need Democrats to save his job? USA Today is reporting that uh, House Speaker Mike Johnson rode to power on the wings of the ultra-right coalition in the Republican Party. But now, now things have changed. Now he faces a revolt from one of the most conservative members of his caucus. And the very thing that made him vulnerable, a willingness to work with Democrats on spending legislation, could be what saves him. When the House of Representatives returns from a two-week recess today, Johnson will face a move to oust him by one of the same staunchly conservative lawmakers who embraced him just months ago. Right-wing firebrand Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, a Republican of Georgia, took the very first step in trying to remove Johnson from his job last month. She filed what's known as a motion to vacate, which would forcibly eject Johnson from the speakership shortly before lawmakers left Washington for recess last month. Green did not try to force a vote on the floor. Instead, she left it as a warning for the speaker. And so, uh, you know, Green's grievances with Johnson escalated after the House passed a $1.2 trillion bill to fund the government long term. The deal failed to win support from the majority of Republicans who object to the bill's total spending levels and lack of stricter policy changes to address the crisis on the southern border. Johnson had to depend on Democrats to pass the bill, inciting fury from the lower chamber's most conservative lawmakers. And so uh, we'll see where this goes. Is it tough talk or uh, is it going to be Groundhog's Day? We're going to see a lot more of what we saw at the top of the year. We shall see. Uh, moving along, Trump's Truth Social shares are plunging again, erasing dollars, billions of dollars in values. About two weeks since it's mediocre <laughs> and what some may call meteoric rather uh, debut, shares of True Social are slumping, wiping out billions of dollars in value in former President Trump's stake. Shares of no. Trump's media and technology group, the company behind True Social, lost 8% on Monday after already losing 12% on Friday. It's now trading at its lowest level since the company's trading debut on March 26. And trading has been remarkably volatile since its debut with some pretty big swings. The sharp declines over the past two days alone will take a big bite out of Trump's paper gains. The former president owns a majority stake in the company, and his stake was valued at about $2.9 billion on Monday, down from a peak of over $6 billion after its debut on its uh, of its trading debut. Um, so that's still an eyebrow raising valuation for former president's stake, considering Trump media lost $58 million last year and had revenue of just over $4 million. And so, you know, uh, we'll, uh, 
Will this uh, $2.9 billion valuation, will it hold or will it continue to decline? It's just another variable in the world of Trump. Moving along uh, back to California, where California fails to track effectiveness of billions spent on homelessness. That's what an, a new audit has found. California has failed to adequately monitor the outcome of its vast spending on homeless programs. Uh, this is according to an audit that was released just today, raising questions about whether billions of dollars meant to tort the crisis has been worth uh, the investment as the number of people living unsheltered has soared. The LA Times has reported that this new report from the California State Auditor's Office found that a state council created to oversee the implementation of homelessness programs has not consistently tracked spending or the outcomes of those programs. The dearth of information means the state lacks pertinent data and that policymakers are likely to struggle to understand homelessness programs, ongoing costs and achieved outcomes. That's what this audit says. And so uh, just so you know, California spent $20 billion over the past five years dedicated to the state's homelessness crisis, including funneling money towards supporting shelters and subsidizing rent. But still, homelessness grew 6% in 2023 from the years prior to more than 180,000 people, according to the federal point-in-time data. And since 2013, homelessness has grown in California by, get this, 53%. So we need that information to know where to better place investments uh, to really get at the root of this. Uh, California really leading the nation in its investment and addressing some of the root causes of homelessness. Uh, without this data, uh, you know, uh, California's influence in terms of how other states do it uh, could be uh, uh, severely undercut. Uh, and uh, when we come forward, we're digging even deeper, even deeper into the headlines. This is a, there's a lot of news that's swirling, uh, including uh, news uh, about uh, uh, what uh, is on the horizon when it comes to uh, addressing gun violence in our country. Yep, we're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about how House Republicans are trying to upend diversity, equity, and inclusion in medical schools and uh, how librarians are even fearing some of the new penalties uh, that are afoot across the country. You're listening to A More Perfect Union on KBLA Talk 1580. More when we come forward. A safe place to go loud, loud, loud. A great place for progressive politics. KBLA Talk 1580. Your floors can go from clean to dirty fast. From juice spills, Whoops, to muddy paw prints, to little sticky finger marks. Good thing your Swiffer WetJet works fast, too. Swiffer WetJet easily cleans everyday messes as quick as they happen. The next mess is right around the corner. So grab your Swiffer WetJet and just spray, push, all clean. The thing no one tells you about periods is that your flow changes every day and so should your tampon size. Tampax has five absorbencies to match your changing flow. If it hurts to remove, go down a size. If it leaks, go up a size. Only Tampax has a leak guard braid to help give you up to 100% leak and odor-free protection. All day comfort and protection for under $5 a month. Based on average U.S. consumer usage at manufacturer's suggested price. However, pricing is at the sole discretion of the retailer. Excludes a Did you know there is a healthcare system serving our community whose vision is health for a better world? What if I told you one of our nation's leading health care providers has a department dedicated to health equity and community engagement? Providence is Southern California's largest and most comprehensive health care network with 11 hospitals and 40 urgent care centers. Providence treats each patient with the compassionate care they deserve when and where they need it. Most importantly, Providence is a diverse family of people and organizations driven by the belief that health is a human right. Providence takes pride in forming community alliances that address health concerns that disproportionately impact those communities. For Minority Health Month, Providence is sponsoring Health for a Better World. Informative conversations with Providence health professionals on Urban Family Focus every Saturday in April at 7 a.m. Get to know more at Providence.org. 
This is KBLA Talk 1580, where hate loses and love wins. More Perfect Union on KBLA Talk 1580. I'm Dr. Nicordola Corte, and I hope everybody is uh, uh, really basking in the afterglow of uh, yesterday. What a wonder it was to look up and uh, what a wonder it will be soon to look down after the solar eclipse. Uh, you know what's about to emerge? A whole lot of cicadas. Yeah, USA Today is reporting that after millions of Americans on the path of totality look up for the solar eclipse uh, just yesterday, prepare to look down. A rare double broad of cicadas is set to emerge in a few weeks. Two different groups or uh, what they call uh, broads, broods of uh, cicadas will emerge across multiple states this year. And the first such emergence in 221 years. Yeah, the 13 year uh, brood uh, will emerge in 14 states across the Southeast and Midwest. And 17 year uh, broods will emerge in five Midwestern states around the same time. This is according to the website Cicada Mania. And like the next solar eclipse, which isn't expected to be seen uh, in the contiguous United States until 2044, the next double emergence of these, these broods won't happen again for a while. The next predicted is 2245. Can you imagine that 2245? I can't imagine 2245. Y'all know, you know, I'll be here with you in spirit. <laughs> 2245, that is a whole nother world. My goodness. Uh, and, uh, and so I, I remember uh, one year when they were here in Washington, D.C., and uh, it's a very unusual experience. All these cicadas chirping. It is something else. Uh, the uh, brood last emerged in 2011, and they have a 13-year life cycle. Uh, and so, um, so get ready. That's a whole lot of cicadas that we're gonna see in here, you know, everywhere. And so, uh, my heart be still. Moving along, you know, we've talked a lot about this war against diversity, equity, and inclusion, and we'll continue to talk about it. Uh, because the war against diversity, equity, and inclusion is really a war against racial justice. It's a war against gender justice. It's a war against LGBTQ justice. It's a war against reproductive justice. It's a war against progress. You know, and, you know, uh, there is nothing wrong. There is no shame. There should be no shame in creating ladders of opportunity for folks who have historically been left out, have historically been pushed out, have historically been told that you don't belong. And so, you know, let's go back to the origin story of these diversity, equity, and inclusion programs and of affirmative action programs and the such. You know, they, they weren't created to make life more difficult for people. They were created to create ladders of opportunity. Uh, and, you know, we're seeing folks uh, really go after and attempt to dismantle these diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. And if they don't full out dismantle them, they want to uh, uh, recreate their intent. What do I mean by that? You know, you know, we're talking about programs that were existed, that were created to support traditionally marginalized people, groups you know, minority groups. Uh, and, you know, a lot of folks are starting to sue to get these programs to allow white people to, to apply and allow white people to benefit, to allow the folks to benefit that have been benefiting, you know, uh, lo long before many folks who belong to these traditionally marginalized groups. Uh, and so, you know, when I saw uh, this latest story, uh, I absolutely had to share it with you, the story from PRISM about how House Republicans are trying to up in DEI, you know where? In medical schools, medical schools. 
Medical students across the United States are sounding the alarm over a new bill introduced in Congress that would ban diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts in medical schools, citing the bill's potential heroin consequences for students and patients alike. Republican Representative Greg Murphy of North Carolina proposed the bill on March 19th, which seeks to cut federal funding to medical schools with DEI programs. And in a Wall Street Journal op-ed, Murphy called DEI efforts quackery. Quackery. And said the bill would require schools to stop teaching topics such as intersectionality, colonization, and white supremacy, dissolve scholarships, classes, and programming designed for students based on their racial background, and eliminate diversity, equity, and inclusion offices. Now, Murphy's bill is a part of a push from Do No Harm. It's a nonprofit launched in 2023 to protest diversity initiatives in medicine, also known as the Embracing Anti-Discrimination, Unbiased Curricula, and Advancing Truth in Education Act. The bill is one domino in the anti-DEI rhetoric gaining momentum in the U.S. as more companies back away from DEI initiatives and cut related jobs. DEI programs in education have faced attacks in states like Florida and Alabama and Texas, and the White House even dissolved its Office of Diversity and Inclusion in late March. We're going to come back to that. Uh, To take it a step further, the Educate Act seeks to take DEI backlash to the federal level. We've seen a lot of examples, as mentioned, on the state level, but this bill is looking to to up the ante and take it to the federal level. Now, while many say it's unlikely to pass and functions more as a message bill, that's what the folks uh, are saying, but some medical students caution how it might endanger future students and patients ahead. Uh, And uh, so we're gonna continue to keep our eye on this story. Um, That is another stunning sign of the times. Uh, And we know sometimes these message bills in Congress that may not have a chance of passing and being signed into law, sometimes they serve as a model bill for folks to take and run with on the state level. Uh, And so uh, it's just astonishing to me that, you know, given that the darkest days of the pandemic are not that far behind us. And we saw what difference black doctors and nurses, you know, Latino doctors and nurses, Asian doctors and nurses, what difference these minority doctors made in the fight against COVID, not just caring for people, but providing valuable life-saving information so that people could make, you know, informed choices as to you know their uptake of the vaccine, the effects of the vaccine, and everything they needed to do to keep them and their family safe. And so we know that had there not been DEI programs and other programs that existed to support more minorities going into medical school and matriculating through medical school, graduating from medical school, uh, that there's a public health impact there. And so Uh, That's why this is important, and this is why we will continue to keep our eye on this. But, you know, we got to keep our eye on the medical schools, and we got to keep our eye on the the libraries, because there are librarians now that fear new penalties, even prison, as activists challenge books. The Associated Press is reporting that um, there's some funny business afoot across the country. Book challenges and bans have soared. To the highest level in decades, public and school-based libraries have been inundated with complaints from community members and conservative organizations such as Moms for Liberty. Increasingly, lawmakers are considering new punishments, crippling lawsuits, hefty fines, and even imprisonment for distributing books that some regard as inappropriate. The trend comes as officials seek to define terms such as obscene and harmful. Much of the conflicts involve materials featuring, that's right, you guessed it, racial and or LGBTQ themes, such as Toni Morrison's novel, The Blue Eye*, And uh, Maya 
Kobabi's memoir, Gender Queer. And while no librarian or educator has been jailed, the threat alone has led to more self-censorship. Already this year, lawmakers in more than 15 states have introduced bills to impose harsh penalties on libraries or librarians. For example, Utah enacted legislation in March that empowers the state attorney general to enforce a new system of challenging or removing, quote, sensitive books from school settings. The law also creates a panel to monitor compliance and violation. And awaiting Idaho Governor Brad Little's signature is a bill that empowers local prosecutors to bring charges against public and school libraries if they don't move, quote, harmful materials away from children. Since the early 1960s, institutions, including schools, libraries, and museums, as well as educators, librarians, and other staffers who distribute materials to children, have largely been exempt from expensive lawsuits or potential criminal charges. These protections began showing up in states as America grappled with the standard surrounding obscenity, which was defined by the Supreme Court back in 1973. You all might remember the ruling. It was a five to four ruling in Miller versus California, where the justices said that obscene materials are not automatically protected by the First Amendment and offer three criteria that must be met for being labeled obscene, whether the work taken as a whole appeals to uh, 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 pre-interest, whether the work depicts or describes in a patently offensive way, sexual conduct specifically defined by the applicable state law, and whether the work lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. This is what they're challenging. This, this is the law that they're looking to pervert in order to advance their agenda. And we can't let them win. You're listening to A More Perfect Union on KBLA Talk 1580. More when we come forward. The station you turn to when you've had it up to gear with cultural incompetence. KBLA Talk 1580. I'm Amber Payton. Here's the latest on the Black Information Network. In a civil lawsuit against the city of Memphis for a black man, Tyree Nichols' death, 30 witnesses, including Nichols' family, Memphis Police Chief C.J. Davis, five former officers, local law enforcement, doctors, first responders, and crime witnesses will testify. The trial is slated for January 2025. The officers face state murder charges in August and federal charges in September of this year. Former Warren, Michigan police officer Matthew Rodriguez pleaded guilty to a federal civil rights violation for excessively using force on a black teenage inmate during booking. Rodriguez punched the victim repeatedly even after he was knocked down, despite the team not physically resisting or posing an immediate threat. Rodriguez faces sentencing in August with a maximum sentence of 10 years in prison. That's the latest. I'm Amber Payton on your home for 24-7 News, the Black Information Network, and BINnews.com. Hey, it's Dean Sharp. How does three months of free electricity and a lifetime of energy savings sound? Well, it's yours when you go solar with Sunlux. Learn more at sunlux.com, sunlux.com. <laughs> this is the KBLA Sports Minute with Ray Richards. Ray Richards. Tiger Woods went through another nine-hole practice round today in preparation for the Masters this week. Tiger said he can win his six Masters if, in his words, everything comes together. That means if his body holds up. The 48-year-old Woods has played only 24 holes this season and has not participated in a PGA event since the Genesis Invitational here in L.A. in February. Tiger is planning to tee off in the first round of the Masters on Thursday. Injuries, surgeries, and a near-fatal car accident have slowed Tiger's career but he is still trying to be competitive. Tiger's last Masters title came in 2019. He made the cut last year, but had to withdraw in the third round because of pain in his right foot. Kawhi Leonard will miss his fifth straight game tonight at Phoenix. The Clippers star still has soreness in his right knee. No debates, no speculation, just the info you need. That's your KBLA Sports Minute. I'm Ray Richardson. More news, opinions, and conversation when we come forward on KBLA Talk 1580. If you say you care about the community, you have to also care about the climate. We're KBLA Talk 1580, and we've got your black flag. We've got a lot to talk about. 
Hi, I'm Zoe Williams, a.k.a. The Voice of Reason, encouraging you to join me weekdays from 7 to 9 p.m. for the world's most intriguing relationship radio roundtable. Every night, I facilitate and encourage our loyal listeners to participate in the most engaging relationship discussions you'll hear anywhere. So make it a point to rendezvous with me, Zoe Williams, the voice of reason, Monday through Friday, 7 to 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Trust me, your relationships will never be the same. The VOR is on fire tonight. Unapologetically progressive. KBLA Talk, 15, 18, 80. We've got your black. black. <laughs> Oh, this cold. Honey? <laughs> honey? Honey, you need Dayquil Severe Honey. Dayquil Severe Honey gives you powerful cold and flu symptom relief with a honey-licious taste. Because life doesn't stop for a cold. Okay, I'm ready to go. <coughs> <coughs> now I'm getting a cold. Honey? Try Dayquil Severe Honey for powerful cold and flu relief. Dayquil Severe with honey flavor. The daytime coughing, aching, stuffy head, fever, honey-licious, power through your day, medicine. Use as directed. Keep out of reach of children. Pizza's here. Oh, great. I'd love some, but I'm worried about my stomach issues. If you're worried about having diarrhea, gas, bloating, stomach pain, or loose oily stools, it may not just be stomach issues. It could be a condition called exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, or EPI. With EPI, the pancreas doesn't release enough enzymes to break down food, but EPI is manageable. Use the symptom checker on identifyepi.com and talk to your doctor. That's identifyepi.com. Sponsored by AbbVie. Find a righteous range and don't be afraid to say what you see. For KBLA Talk 1580. Talk 1580. I'm Dr. Nicordelai Corte, and uh, we're digging deeper into the headlines. Just a friendly uh, reminder that uh, tomorrow on the Tavis Smiley Show, uh, Dr. Cornell West will be joining him exclusively to uh, unveil. Uh, his VP running mate. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, be sure to check that out at 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific time. That's 12 noon Eastern time um, to see who Dr. West uh, picks to join him on the campaign trail uh, as uh, he uh, uh, advances his bid uh, to uh, run for president. And so uh, we'll all be tuned in listening to that. Uh, but that's not the only campaign news uh, that is uh, catching people's attention. New voting laws in swing states could shape the 2024 election. Uh, the Washington Post is reporting that voting in Michigan will be easier for many people this fall than it was four years ago. There will be nine days of early voting. All mail ballots will have prepaid return postage, and every community will have at least one drop box for absentee ballots because of a measure adopted by voters with the support of the state's top Democrats. Now, those casting ballots in North Carolina, where Republicans enjoy a veto-proof legislative majority, will see dramatic changes in the opposite, opposite direction. For the first time in a presidential election, voters there will have to show an ID and more votes are expected to be thrown out because of new absentee ballot return deadlines. And courts will soon decide whether to allow a law to go into effect that would reshape the state's election boards and could result in fewer early voting sites. Now, the two states, Michigan and North Carolina, they illustrate how much voting has changed since the last presidential election. But whether Americans will have an easier or harder time casting ballots than they did in 2020 will depend on where they live. Often, whether Democrats or Republicans have been in charge. States across the partisan spectrum abruptly changed their voting policies in 2020, y'all remember this, to provide options at the height of the COVID pandemic. Many eased the criteria for voting by mail, and some sent absentee ballots or ballot applications to all voters. Election officials installed ballot drop boxes, remember those, that were set up curbside. They also set up curbside voting programs and in some cases extended the deadline for returning absentee ballots. Former President Donald Trump has baselessly accused Democrats of using the loosened rules to rig the 2020 vote 
turning election policy into the object of hyperpolarized disagreement, particularly in swing states where Republicans have generally pushed for tighter laws such as voter ID requirements and limits on mail-in voting in the name of election integrity. Imagine that. Democrats have advocated eliminating barriers that could suppress voter participation, including by making rules for registering to vote and casting ballots more flexible. And so this is also just another variable in this high stakes election. Uh, you know, while folks are sort of kicking the tires on their candidate of choice or potential candidate of choice, you got these new voting laws, particularly in swing states, you know, that, you know, could make it easier or harder depending on where you live. And so, you know, we are all about, you know, looking at the world through our asset lenses, not our deficit lenses. And so we want to empower people here. And so how can you sort of tamp down some of the anxiety uh, that this news might be inducing? Well, you know, check your voter registration. Go to IWillVote.com. Uh, and it's nonpartisan and it will tell you everything you need to know, everything you're going to need in order to cast your vote. So whether you vote by mail or you vote in person, all the information is there no matter where you live. Go to IWillVote.com um, and you can get all the information that you need. And just how we plan for vacations and we plan for, you know, uh, you know, all the other activities that we want to engage in throughout the year. Uh, it's never too late to plan, to, to develop your plan for how you're going to vote, how you're going to vote uh, and how your family is going to vote and pass it on. Because, you know, your vote is your voice. Your, vo your vote is your voice. And uh, we are all about amplifying uh, you know, the voices of our fellow Americans uh, on this program. And so uh, uh, this isn't the last you'll be hearing from us on this, but uh uh, take it serious, folks. Take it seriously. Take it seriously. Take it seriously. Uh, moving along, NBC News reporting that the Arizona Supreme Court has ruled that a near total abortion ban from 1864 is enforceable. Can't make this stuff up. The Arizona Supreme Court ruled today that a 160 year old near total abortion ban still on the books in the state is enforceable. A bombshell decision that adds the state to the growing list of places where abortion care is effectively banned. Now, in just a moment, I'm going to uh, play you a little clip of uh, Senator uh, Kelly from Arizona uh, responding uh, to this ruling on Capitol Hill. But let me first just tell you that this ruling allows an 1864 law in Arizona to stand that made abortion a felony punishable by two to five years in prison for anyone who performs one or helps a woman obtain one. The law, which was codified in 1901 and again in 1913, outlaws abortion from the moment of conception, but includes an exception to save the woman's life. The Civil War era law enacted a half century before Arizona even gained statehood was never repealed. And an appellate court ruled last year that it could remain on the books as long as it was, quote, harmonized with a 2022 law leading to substantial confusion in Arizona regarding exactly when during a pregnancy abortion was outlawed. Take a listen uh, to what Senator Kelly had to say on Capitol Hill today uh, about this bombshell ruling. All right, we may still be waiting for that to come up. Hey, before I uh, talk about, I wanna say a few words about the disastrous decision by the Arizona Supreme Court today to reinstate a total ban on abortion from a law that was passed in 1864, before Arizona was a state, actually 48 years before Arizona became a state. 
Senator Stabenow mentioned one out of three women live in a state that have an extreme abortion, abortion ban. Well, about 30 minutes ago, that number went up. This is going to criminalize doctors for doing their jobs, and it's going to have a devastating effect on the health and freedom of women in Arizona. It's going to put lives at risk. Now, this law may have been written 160 years ago, but it's only being reinstated now because of politicians who work to overturn Roe v. Wade. In fact, in the Supreme Court ruling today, it mentioned the Dobbs decision 22 times. This is devastating for women in Arizona. I've got a daughter and granddaughter in Arizona. This is not who we are as Arizonans. And I refuse to allow Arizona to become a state where doctors are going to be afraid to practice and just do their jobs. Women deserve the right to make these decisions on their own, not politicians in Washington making them for them. So I'm going to continue to work to fix this. But I've got to you know, stress that this is a really sad day for the state of Arizona. Well, it is a very sad day, not just uh, for uh, people of the state of, uh, in the state of Arizona, but the people across this country. It is just another example uh, of uh, the challenges that we're going to continue to see across the country because of the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Uh, basically, it's a state-by-state -state, uh, patchwork uh, related to uh, uh, people's right to an abortion, women's right to an abortion. Uh, and uh, this is obscene. I don't know. I don't know how, how what other way to see it. Uh, that a law that has been on the books for over a hundred years is now being used to uh, uh, really sort of blunt the right uh, for women in Arizona to be able to uh, uh, get abortion care. Uh, it is uh, sure to animate uh, voting in Arizona and across the country. Uh, and, you know, you better believe, uh, you know, abortion rights are on the ballot this November. This is a very important issue uh, to women across this country and women uh, around the world are looking to see uh, where America lands on this. And so, you know, we're going to continue to track this and track the response to this. I've, I already saw on social media, the, the vice president has, has uh, put out uh, a video uh, res responding to this. And, um, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're going to see uh, uh, how uh, folks in Arizona respond to this. You know, I always end every show saying, don't panic, organize, do what you can from where you are with what you have. Well, we're going to see what the women of Arizona and people of conscience in Arizona, uh, you know, we're going to see everything they got uh, to uh, organize, uh, to push back against uh, this really problematic uh, ruling coming out of Arizona uh, today. Uh, moving along for 2024, young voters, they're at the top of Biden's wish list, but can he win them over? Can he do it? He's certainly uh, trying to do it. USA Today is reporting that uh, uh, President Biden could have a lock, you know, on these voters, uh, but uh, that's not exactly the way things are are going right now. Experts say young voters nationally may ultimately decide the 2024 presidential race. In 2016, young voters helped Trump claim victory by either staying home or choosing a third party candidate, and in 2020. They helped Biden win by turning out near record numbers and skipping third party options. In 2016, nearly 40 percent of young voters cast ballots, rising to 50 percent in 2020. It's according to the nonpartisan Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement at Tufts in Massachusetts. Although young voters are typically less likely to identify as Republican or Democrat, they are more likely 
to vote for Democratic candidates. Today, polls show that Biden has weak support among young voters and that while 26 percent of Americans overall have a negative view of both Trump and Biden, a significantly larger 41 percent of young voters dislike both. That's according to a poll by Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. They say many young liberal voters say that they understand that Biden's reelection depends heavily on their support and hope his campaign and administration begins addressing their concerns more forcefully. They are uh, well aware that if they don't give Biden their vote, Trump will more easily win. So we'll see how this thing shakes out. More on a more perfect union right here on KBLA Talk 1580 when we come forward. The quiet part out loud. 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 KBLA Talk 1580. Tips to help improve your credit score in 2024. Establishing credit is an important key to achieving financial health, but building a credit history from scratch can feel challenging since you need credit to build credit. First, what does it mean to build credit? All consumers have a score between 300 and 850. You want your score to be as high as possible as lenders look at your credit score to make loan and credit decisions. A good credit score shows you have a track record of borrowing money responsibly. Remember, it's never too late to build or rebuild your credit. This segment is sponsored by J.P. Morgan Chase & Company. At Charmin, we heard you shouldn't talk about going to the bathroom in public, so we decided to sing about it. When you're rolling Charmin, open up on the party. Let's get most of it back at everybody. Charmin, Tim, and Sister Bitcoin, and Hey, Ice. Our girls always talk. It's our party, party. It's special, baby. Sherman Ultra Soft is irresistibly soft and more absorbent, so you can use less. Enjoy the go with Sherman. Thanks for calling Discover. This is Gabby. Hey, Gabby. It's Jennifer Coolidge. Hi. I'm, I'm so glad I reached you at 2 a.m. Oh, of course. Anyone with a Discover card can call and talk to a real person 24-7. Now, how can I help? Yeah, I used my Discover card to buy these yellow pleather pajamas, and I'm just not sure I'm pulling them off. 24-7 U.S.-based customer service. It pays to Discover. Limitations apply. Learn more at discover.com slash credit card. We're not for everybody, but we're for everybody. You're listening to KBLA Talk 1580. KBLA Talk 1580. I'm Dr. Nicola Corte. And uh, right before we went on air, the New York Times reported that uh, a woman was sentenced to a month in prison over theft of Ashley Biden's diary. A federal judge in Manhattan sentenced a Florida woman on Tuesday, that's today, to one month behind bars, just one month, for her role in a brazen scheme to steal the diary of President Biden's daughter and sell it to a right-wing group in the hope of disrupting the 2020 election. The conduct of the woman, Amy Harris, quote, was despicable and consequently very serious. That's what Judge Laura Taylor Swain of the Federal District Court of the Southern District of New York said before handing down a punishment, Ms. Harris, 41 tested the patience of prosecutors and the judge overseeing the case, missing repeated sentencing dates and jeopardizing what otherwise appeared to be a likely path to probation. In August 2022, she pleaded guilty to conspiring to transport the stolen diary to New York, where she met with employees of the group Project Veritas and sold it for $40,000 just weeks before the election. The judge also sentenced her to three years probation along with three months of home confinement and ordered her to pay back the money that she earned from the sale. The sentencing of Ms. Harris reflects the seriousness of the government's effort to deter people from interfering in elections. That includes former President Donald J. Trump, who is awaiting federal trial in Washington on charges of trying to subvert the outcome of the 2020 race. I don't know about you. I feel like this is a light sentence. I feel like that's a that's a slap on the wrist. I mean, you stole the diary of the daughter of the president of the United States. You sold it for forty thousand dollars in an attempt, in an attempt to uh, subvert our election. What? 
you know, we, at some point, you know, folks have got to ask themselves all these efforts to subvert the election. You got, you know, folks traveling here to the Capitol on January 6th to disrupt a democratic process. You have, you know, folks sending fake electors, organizing fake electors to be a part of that process from different parts of the country. There were efforts afoot to kidnap a sitting governor in Michigan. You know, efforts, uh, you know, afoot to uh, potentially hang the vice president of the United States, Mike Pence. Folks lurking through the halls of the Capitol looking for then Speaker Nancy Pelosi. And now here you have, you know, someone who uh, is, you know, found guilty and pleaded guilty to a scheme to steal the diary of President Biden's daughter and sell it to a right wing group in hopes of disrupting the 2020 election. How much more evidence do we need? And why are these sentences so light? Just saying, the quiet part out loud. You're listening to A More Perfect Union on KBLA Talk 1580. More when we come forward. KBLA Talk 1580 is an intervention. When we come forward, includes you. KBLA Talk 1580, turning pain into power. KBLA Talk 1580. KBLA reminds you that when we fight, we win, and we don't black down. LA Community Action Network, or LA CAN, was formed in 1999 when 25 residents of downtown LA came together and acknowledged the problems that existed in their community and made a commitment to do something about those problems, to stand together, organize, and become a force in the community that demands change. Civil rights and preventing the criminalization of poverty are their core projects. In addition, they take on women's rights, the human right to housing, and healthy food access. LA CAN also has projects focused on economic development, civic participation, voter engagement, and community media. While downtown LA remains their home base, with a particular emphasis on the Skid Row community, in 2007, they expanded their housing and healthy food access work into South Central Los Angeles. LA CAN believes that power for low-income people and people of color is achieved through a large, active, and well-informed member base that utilizes a multitude of methods to advance their messages and goals. If you'd like to join the Los Angeles Community Action Network and organize people to fight back against oppression, please visit cangress.org. That's cangress.org. This is a community call to action from KBLA Talk 1580. KBLA Talk 1580. Eggs are a staple in our diets, and there's only one egg with more delicious farm fresh taste plus superior nutrition. Eggland's best. With more vitamins, including six times more vitamin D and 10 times more vitamin E, plus 25% less saturated fat than ordinary eggs. Available in so many delicious varieties. Classic, cage-free, and organic. Eggland's best. Better taste, better nutrition, better eggs. This is KBLA Talk 1580, where everybody is somebody and nobody is a stranger. You belong here. To a more perfect union on KBLA Talk 1580. Uh, let me finish with this the increasingly authoritarian, curious Republican Party. You just heard me you know, lay out just a number of cases that have been before the courts uh, around mostly Republicans, mostly conservatives, mostly people on the far right uh, that were doing various things to subvert our democratic process. Uh, you just heard you know, that the, uh, the ruling on the woman that, was, uh, that pleaded guilty to stealing uh, Ashley Biden, the president's daughter's diary, uh, and sold it to a, a far right group for forty thousand dollars in an effort to try and you know uh, uh, subvert the twenty twenty election. Well, you know this stuff is not all that uncommon, particularly in uh, countries with uh, 
authoritarianism uh, uh, in uh, their uh, government. Donald Trump is eyeing a more authoritarian second term in the White House, and increasingly Republicans seem inclined to support that goal. Polling on the GOP's appetite for more powerful chief executives has been slow in coming, but uh, it's been coming. And the emerging picture is that Republicans are remarkably on board with a president who isn't answerable to Congress and the courts, significantly more so than Democrats. And perhaps as significantly, very few Republicans seem to strongly object to the idea. The most recent survey comes from uh, the Associated Press. It shows uh, a bit of a difference between the two parties on whether unilateral presidential power is a good thing. 17% Democrats say it is, while 26% of Republicans agree, not a huge number on either side. But then the survey got to the actual point by asking about specific presidents exercising such power without waiting for Congress and the courts. Well, while 39% Democrats said that working around Congress and the courts was a good thing if the president was named Biden, 57% of Republicans said it would be a good thing if the president were named Trump. Take that to the voting booth. We'll have to end it there. My thanks to the entire village that helps us to produce a more perfect union each and every day. Our show producer, Tavis Smiley, our sound engineer extraordinaire, Miles Lowe, our show producer, Robert Battles, and podcast publishing guru, Odell Bodie. Also, big thanks to all of you for tuning in. Don't forget to join us again, same time, same place tomorrow. Till then, remember, don't panic, organize. Do what you can from where you are with what you have. I'm Dr. Nicordelai Corte, and you've been listening to A More Perfect Union.